Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Sydney Ideas. This is the University of Sydney's public talks program. It is a great pleasure to have your company and thank you for joining us. My name is Fenella Kernebone and I'm the head of programming for Sydney Ideas. Before I introduce you to your moderator, I would firstly like to acknowledge uh, and pay respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we all meet, where we live, where we work, and we share ideas, wherever you happen to be joining us today online. I also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation because it is on their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. And as we share our own knowledge, our teaching and our learning, as well as our research practices within our university, may we also pay respects to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So again, thank you for joining us. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce and welcome our moderator for today's conversation, Professor Tim Soupomerson. Over to you, Tim. Thank you so much, Fenella, and welcome to this Sydney Ideas event and today's discussion, whether you're joining us by Zoom or joining us on Facebook Live via the University of Sydney's Facebook page. I'm Tim Supomasan and I'm Director of Culture Strategy at the University of Sydney, also Professor of Practice in the School of Social and Political Sciences here at the University. And thank you for being part of this discussion about Australia's responsibilities to the people of Afghanistan. As we know, it's been a tumultuous time for Afghanistan these past few weeks. On Sunday, the 15th of August, the insurgent Taliban took control of the Afghan capital, Kabul, confronting many Afghans with the stark choice of either staying or fleeing their country. We saw scenes of people scrambling to Kabul airport. And while some managed to board flights out of the country, many others were not able to do so. The scenes of helicopters evacuating people from the grounds of the US Embassy in Kabul prompted many to recall similar scenes going back to 1975 and the fall of Saigon. Well, today we are joined by a panel that is eminently qualified to help us not just make sense of what has happened in Afghanistan, but perhaps more importantly, what we, particularly here in Australia, can do and must do for the people of Afghanistan. And today we ask the following questions. What is Australia doing for refugees from Afghanistan and for those from Afghanistan who are already here in the country? What more needs to be done by the Australian and other allied governments? And central to all this is another central essential question. What exactly are the responsibilities that Australia owes to the people of Afghanistan? Before I get into our panel, I also just want to acknowledge that for many here in Australia who have family and friends in Afghanistan, this is of course a very distressing time. Uh, and want to highlight, uh, there, there is support available via Lifeline on 131114. Uh, we're also putting resources for support in the Zoom chat and on Facebook live. And uh, for all of you joining us who may have a question, uh, we've got Slido up and running. So this is an online mechanism to take your questions and also to get you to vote on the questions you'd like to put to the panel. Uh, and we're using that via slido.com. So please go to um, slido.com and use the hashtag Sydney Ideas if you've got a question in mind or want to vote on the questions you'd like to see our panel answer. We also have live captions on, um, information coming up for you in the chat if you'd like to see and use the captions. So uh, let me now introduce to you our panelists for today, uh, Mujib Abid, Mary Croc, William Maley, and Shakufa Tahiri. Uh, Mujib Abid is a PhD candidate at the University of Queensland and he conducts research on the histories of encounters with modernity in Afghanistan. He has a particular focus on questions of power, resistance, and tradition. And he also currently teaches as a sessional academic at the University of Melbourne. Thanks for joining us, Majib. Thanks for having me, Tim. Thank you. Also joining us is Mary Croc. Mary is Professor of Public Law and Co-Director of the Sydney Centre for International Law at the University of Sydney. Uh, she's one of Australia's preeminent uh, 
public and international lawyers. Her expertise spans immigration, citizenship and refugee law, disability rights, administrative and constitutional law, among many other fields. And she's written many leading texts on Australian immigration and refugee law and the intersections between disability, migration and human rights. Welcome, Mary. Also joining us is William Maley, who is Professor in the Department of International Relations at the Australian National University, uh, where William has previous, was previously the Foundation Director of the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. William has taught for many years at UNSW ADFA. He's also held visiting posts at the Russian Diplomatic Academy, the University of Strathclyde and the University of Oxford. He's also Vice President of the Refugee Council of Australia, and brings to our discussion today more than 40 years experience studying the international politics of Afghanistan. Welcome, William. My pleasure. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Shakufa Tahiri joins us. Shakufa is Deputy Chair of the National Refugee Advocacy and Advisory Group and is a former policy officer at the Refugee Council of Australia. Her work involves policy analysis, research and advocacy on issues affecting uh, people seeking asylum and also refugees. She's an advisory member to the UNSW Cowdall Centre for International Refugee Law and a member too of the advisory panel of Australia's resettlement of Afghan nationals announced recently by the Australian government to advise on the settlement needs of Afghan refugees. Welcome, Shakufa. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so before we get into the panel, just a reminder again, if you've got a question, hop on slido.com, use that hashtag SydneyIdeas. Um, let me get things underway then, and I might start with you, Mujib. Uh, Mujib, you were evacuated from Kabul with your family very recently. So you, you have been on the ground there in Afghanistan and have borne witness to, to what's happened these past few weeks. Can, can you tell us a bit more about where you are now uh, and about your experience evacuating uh, from Kabul. Uh, you know, it's wonderful to, 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 to have you joining us, um, but uh, I know that our audience would be really interested to hear your reflections having been there on the ground. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so yes, I was in Kabul and uh, I was there to help my family get out of there. I got there in late July. And then before I knew it, we kind of ran out of time. The few plans that we had didn't quite work out. Things were changing very rapidly on the ground. And, you know, at one point I was as stranded as all of them. Um, and then from there, the sort of, you know, week long uh, struggle of, of trying to get to the airport started, uh, as, you know, which, which also sort of gave me this exposure to the reality of a horrifying situation that was unfolding right in front of our eyes. And in our case, to have to experience that time and again, like many other thousands of people uh, had to experience that. Um, there was, you know, it's, 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 it was volatile, it was chaotic, entirely out of control. The people who were authorized with keeping, you know, with crowd control and whatnot, you couldn't, you weren't quite sure who you were talking to because there were different lines. So you had the Taliban militiamen, then you had these um, uh, uh, so-called zero one or Sifriac units who are at the payroll of the Americans had been for years, have quite a, quite a notorious reputation. And so you had to deal with those guys. And then, and then if you were lucky, you could, you could, you could reach one of those lines where, you know, a coalition uh, troops would be standing and hopefully they would talk to you. So we tried on a number of occasions and we, we, we couldn't get, but eventually we did. And, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but look, as a whole, it is, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a perfect st storm what happened at the home at Karzai International uh, Airport. I think many different factors have had to coalesce, had to come together uh, for a situation as uh, combustible to, to kind of materialize. Uh, it includes, uh, you know, the, the crescendo of the war on terror, the way it came to a head. It includes 20 years of, uh, you know, wartime propaganda, misinformation that had affected people's, you know, imaginaries of one another, I suppose, including the Taliban in this case, where people were running away from. And look, another thing that I don't think we should forget about, it includes, you know, and again, it might take a lot of reflection and thinking and writing to make sense of this. But I think to me, 
the airport stood for like a breakdown of the sort of hierarchies that the war on terror had been built on and state building had been built on. It was this sort of liberal promise uh, that was never quite afforded to everyone, but it was nonetheless promised to everyone. It managed to deliver to very few uh, elites. But with the airport, I think all of those lines and boundaries, all of a sudden, they were not there anymore. So a shopkeeper and a US military contractor would, were both finding themselves in the same position. At long last, that, law, that promise could be materialized if only one could manage to get themselves to the airport. Or so went the, the, the thought process, I imagine. Uh, so there's, but still, there's a lot. I think that we should, we should, a lot uh, that we should engage with thinking together uh, to make sense of that, that that situation. Thank you, Mujib, and lots for us to to really think through there. Um, uh, but those scenes at the airport really serve to crystallize uh, so much of what's been happening over the past. 20 years. Uh, Shakufa, let me bring you in here. Mujib's described a, a chaotic and combustible situation at Kabul airport. Now, you remain very closely engaged with uh, the Hazara and other diaspora communities from Afghanistan here in Australia. Can I ask you how people in those communities have responded to what's happened in recent weeks? Uh, thanks so much, Tim. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hosting this uh, webinar, um, and I'd like to begin with, with, with acknowledging uh, that I uh, appear here from the land of the Euro Nation. Uh, Tim, it has been a few very, very difficult weeks, um, I think, probably in our lifetime. Um, we've seen a crisis of a significant magnitude on every level. Uh, every one of us has spent past few weeks in utter despair, shock and helplessness, um, uh, you know, seeing long-standing existen existential question about the future of Afghanistan since we have been kids, really. Uh, for me, that question began when I was about five to six years old, uh, when we escaped the Taliban's first uh, round of actually takeover in 1990, late 1999. We all witnessed the horrifying scenes from the airport. And as, as Mujib said, um, it, it was chaotic, but I think that chaotic is a very, uh, very much an understatement. It really stands as a metaphor uh, for the fragility of um, uh, the ground that Afghanistan stood on, um, and that it broke in a way that was, um, uh, for some, predictable. But I think that uh, for for me and for other communities, it was uh, a, a total shock. And I think importantly, um, the you know airport scene was really an uh, a sim a symbolic for the despair, helplessness, and frightened population of Afghanistan now at the hands of their enemies. Um, it, it's one of the you know biggest hostage situation uh, for uh, the most of the, most of the population um, that are facing a very very bleak future. Um, in terms of uh, you know communities here, obviously um, uh, in addition to the despair that we are individually facing, um, I suppose there has been pressure and ask uh, for help from all sides, especially from you know refugee um, refugees who are on permanent protection visas who still have you know uh, sort of their long stays long standing ongoing visa applications say for five six years for their families to unite with them um, who are deprioritized uh, by you know uh, migration instruments um, as they're considered um, IMA uh, arrivals and then you know, you have, uh, on the other hand, TPV holders, so temporary protection visa holders, refugees who are genuinely recognized our, uh, under our own domestic processes as, um, you know, Australia owing them protection, uh, who have no prospect uh, at, the, uh, at the moment of gaining permanent protection in the face of the crisis that has unfolded in Afghanistan. So the despair from them really then um, uh, has been compounded, asking questions of whether we are able to save our families. And obviously we each, you know, in diaspora have families and friends and communities stuck there. Um, at, when it was the evacuation phase, it was really the desperate calls to save them. And, you know, there was such a demand, such such a huge, um, you know, number of asks to be saved for, especially for prominent people that we're connected with, um, that, um, you know, I think ways of amnesty was too little and too late. And you now have a lot of those people stuck um, under direct threat of the Taliban. So it has been a really, really difficult um, few weeks uh, on all sides, I suppose, trying to actually talk on all sides with community with the civil society, with the government, uh, to come up with um, some solid commitment in, in the face of such a huge crisis in which Australia has historically been um, you know, uh, involved in, and we uh, owe a commitment to people of Afghanistan. Thank you, Shakufa, and you, you paint a very clear picture of uh, how uh, people are responding to, to what's happening. Uh, William, I want to bring you in here now. Uh, uh, Mujib and Shakufa have set the scene for us um, here, as it were, um, and I want to get us into this question of responsibility. 
I know you've been studying Afghanistan for a very long time. Uh, given the occupation of Afghanistan by allied forces for almost 20 years, um, I wanted to ask you, what is the responsibility that Australia and other allied countries, uh, what is the responsibility they owe to the people of Afghanistan, given what's just happened? Mm. Uh, I think one needs to distinguish between different individuals and actors in Australia who may owe responsibilities. Uh, at one level, uh, the Australian government owes responsibilities towards Afghanistan in general and people within Afghanistan because of specific commitments that may have been made in the past. Whilst for purposes of domestic consumption in Australia, the narrative defending uh, a deployment to Afghanistan tended to be cast in terms of the alliance with the United States and uh, the need to prevent terrorism from uh, uh, coming into Australia, which is always a rather spurious argument. Uh, Afghans within Afghanistan were assured repeatedly by the United States and its allies, including Australia, that, um, that their presence was there to support the Afghans and that they would not abandon them in the future. And in a sense, if you make promises towards people, you shouldn't be surprised if people expect those promises to be kept. Uh, when you say, I promise, that's not just uh, uh, uttering words, it's actually doing something. Uh, and uh, so uh, obligations can flow from the durability of the commitments that were foreshadowed by uh, Australia and other Western players when they became involved in Afghanistan. Separate from those, we have very strong senses of commitment towards particular people in Afghanistan flowing from the personal relationships that developed over time between Australian military personnel who had interpreters and other support staff, uh, between aid workers and their own teams within Afghanistan. Uh, those people may well regard their Afghan counterparts as much more their mates than they re would regard politicians in Canberra. Uh, and this has confronted the Australian government with, with a somewhat unusual situation where large numbers of potential refugees within Afghanistan have very strong supporters uh, within Australia already. Um, those who might flow out as refugees and not just nameless numbers on a list that was afterwards mislaid to quote Pasternak but people who are known to significant people within the community and very strongly supported by those. And that uh, does create a challenge for the government because whilst with elections coming up, um, there may well be a disposition to try to keep Pauline Hanson's supporters happy in Queensland. Um, that can run up against the sense of obligation that perhaps thousands of people in the wider Australian community to feel towards uh, Afghans who worked for them, who supported them, who often put their lives on the line in order to protect um, foreign um, workers uh, serving the cause of reconstruction in Afghanistan. Uh, and that gives rise to a very tricky situation at the moment where moral claims, which very often political leaders would like to be able to brush aside, may be not so easy to brush aside as they would like. Thank you, William. Uh, Mary, William there talks about some of the promises that have been made to people in Afghanistan. Um, can I ask you, what legal duties do you see Australia owing to, yeah. the Australian government owing to the people of Afghanistan? And uh, how do those legal duties differ from the moral duties that may be? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Tim. Um, I've got my, uh, my um, microphone on this time. Uh, I think... Professor Bill has set out very well um, the moral obligations uh, that Australia has assumed in becoming so embroiled in Af Afghanistan. Uh, in terms of the, the legal obligations, uh, we should start with the Afghans who are physically in Australia, because there you can talk about some very hard law that is that is available. We are we owe obligations to protect Afghans in Australia who would be at risk if they were sent back to Afghanistan, no doubt about it. And I know for a fact we've got close to 400 people who are still in asylum determination processes. Those people should be pulled out of those processes, whether it's in the court system or in, in the part of the administrative process, they should be pulled out and visaed straight away. Um, 
you have individuals who are at threat of removal from Australia, at threat of deportation. Those people should be assured that they are not to be removed if they face persecution upon return to Afghanistan. Um, so uh, I would start with the people in Australia. Um, I would love to see everyone who is on a temporary visa and Shukufa referred to a number of these people already. Uh, it's deliberate giving people temporary visas rather than permanent to stop them from sponsoring family. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I think at some point, Australia really has to grapple with our obligations under international law, which do extend to obligations to allow families to reunite, certainly immediate family. And we have individuals in Australia who have wives and children who they are unable to bring to Australia because of their, their visa status here. So if we look at international law and obligations, we absolutely have legal obligations to do more with the Afghans who are physically in Australia. As for those who are overseas, I think Professor Bill set it out beautifully. We've got many individuals. I have been fielding all sorts of calls this week, as I'm sure many of my colleagues and people online have been as well, about people at obvious risk in Afghanistan who were not able to make it onto those planes. Now, strictly speaking, we don't have a legal obligation to do anything for these people, but morally, it is an overwhelming obligation, I think, and people understand that. Uh, there are academics all around the world who are getting together, uh, setting up shared drop boxes and starting by looking at all the different countries and what, what ways, what visas are available from India through to Sweden um, to, to bring people out. So this is truly a global conflict. It's a conflict that has affected people all around, all around the world. And I think that the sense, overwhelming sense of moral obligation uh, is weighing heavily on a lot of people in Australia as in, as in other countries. Thank you, um, Mary. And we do want to get into some of the detail around how we can help or how uh, we can we can ensure uh, uh, people get to safety. Um, but before we, we do, uh, Shakufa, can I bring you back into the conversation? Um, we, we've we've heard the government say that it's reserved three thousand places within the existing humanitarian uh, intake for refugees from Afghanistan. Can can you talk us through, given that you've been following this so closely, how many refugees? are coming to Australia from Afghanistan? And, and do you think the government here has been doing enough to support the situation? Um, I think the question of whether Australia is doing enough is, um, is uh, no, it's not doing enough. Um, I think that uh, so far the focus has been entirely on evacuation um, and settlement of um, uh, those who have been actually evacuated and their post uh, settlement um, sort of discussions. But I think here we are missing something um, and that is actually a solid commitment from the government um, in, in, in response to uh, such a huge uh, crisis um, in Afghanistan where we have been historically involved. And obviously Australian government has been saying that uh, we will honor um, in a way uh, the, the historic involvement that we have had in Afghanistan uh, by, in, in, by reflecting that in the response that we will take. Um, I think the time for that response is now and imminent. Um, we can't really wait for uh, sort of for the situation to get worse. Um, it already has been worse in the past few weeks. Um, I think people are very, very frantic at the community level about sort of a solid or specific or more accurate response that Australia uh, takes. Um, obviously, the number um, that Australia has announced, and that's the second commitment post-evacuation, is 3,000 additional uh, to the program that we have um, that takes in 13,750 refugees every year. And, um, you know, just a side note that this is an already reduced program. It was cut uh, actually by 5,000 last year, it used to be 18,750. So we are already actually on a reduced program and increasing that composition by not 3,000 actually, because the intake of Afghan refugees have been there. Um, it's more so speaking of around 2,000 and, and 
considering that um, you know uh, we're not really clear whether um, a number of those who have been evacuated would actually fall under that program. How many numbers would that leave uh, for for others? Uh, uh, you know, for families, for instance, if they are trying to save their families through, through that program. So it, it is not a commitment. It absolutely not even remotely meets um, sort of the not even the demand. But I think that um, what, what what's the right thing to do? And I think that reflecting on the history of um, Australia, Australian government, and under this government actually taking measures to um, uh, announce an intake of say 16,000 for Syrian Iraqis uh, a few years ago only under uh, the administration of um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Ab Abbott um, who, you know, we, we, it, there, the possibility is there, uh, the capacity is there, and I think that the public sentiments has never been so much in, in favour of an intake um, that, that's meaningful. Um, when um, Tony Abbott actually made, made that announcement of 16,000, um, uh, there wasn't um, uh, that uh, sentiment was actually born out of Alan Kurdi's uh, picture, uh, but now that um, uh, you know the response that Australia needs to take actually is born out of our uh, 20 years of involvement in direct in, uh, involvement in Afghanistan. So if uh, the commitment is not um, at least 16,000 um, announcement over you know perhaps a few years, but it has to be more. Um, you know, saying that we will be actually uh, sort of these 3,000 is a flooring, not a ceiling, um, is is uh, unclear it really provides a very vague and confusing picture for people who are um, actually forming false hopes about this program um, as to whether it is actually worth having uh, you know giving it a go uh, for people who are really in desperate situations and at community level obviously has created anxiety stress a lot of uh, despair and uh, you know sort of hasty uh, applications to um, secure a spot um, mm -hmm. that Australia may have. So I think that uh, looking at our, uh, you know recent history, uh, Australia is obviously able to um, you know uh, make a better commitment and I think a timely commitment as well because uh, time is running out. Thank you, Sh uh, Sh Shikufa. Uh, Mary, can I bring you in here? Um, Canada. Uh, very quickly announced after the Taliban takeover that it would uh, resettle 20,000 mm. Afghan refugees. Uh, is that the sort of thing that Australian, the Australian government should be considering doing? Well, I look at what we did after the war in Vietnam, where we brought in hundreds of thousands. Uh, I know that nobody has the appetite for that today, but I think one of the questions that we need to ask is uh, how are we going to safely get people out of Afghanistan? Um, there are a lot of people holed up in uh, Pakistan and in, in a sense they are easier to deal with. Pakistan already before this outflow was hosting nearly a million Afghan refugees. <clears throat> but uh, I think consideration needs to be given globally with the US to trying to uh, create a program for the orderly departure of individuals who want to leave the country. That's what happened after Vietnam. And I know it's very difficult to talk about uh, when everything is so raw, uh, but it, the, the US managed to do it after the fall of Saigon. And so I think that uh, at some point we need to start treating with the Taliban if they are able to form a government of some kind. I'm just gonna put that out there. Mm. Well, well, we'll come to that very shortly. Mm. Before we do, uh, Mijib, I wanted to ask you a, a question about how things are, uh, uh, have, have got to, to where they are um, uh, in, in thinking about uh, what we need to do. I, I'm tempted also to ask, well, should we have done more earlier? And uh, recently, Australia's form, uh, former Australian ambassador to the United States, Japan and India, John McCarthy, wrote uh, about uh, the Australian response to Afghanistan. He says, and I quote, Western governments have been on notice since April of the dangers of the precipitate, co precipitate collapse of major Afghan cities. Some like the British and Canadians tried to do something about it. We could all remember Saigon. Australia dragged its heels taking refuge in the arcane petty foggery of a Dickens novel, ignoring the views of those who understood what was happening on the ground. In recent months, we have lost our capacity to argue from the high ground. Sadly, we are no longer a leader, but have become something paltry and second rate. End quote. Majib, uh, does John McCarthy have a point here? And uh, I mean, does that square with your assessment, uh, having been on the ground recently? Well, I guess, I guess 
But he does and he doesn't. Uh, I'll put it that way. Well, first and foremost, I think uh, he's right that uh, the, there were indicators, very strong indicators. Uh, since May of this year, when this Taliban campaign started, uh, the, the rapid um, collapse of districts uh, every month, there would be 50, 60, and then that number kept rising. Um, that, those were clear indicators that things were going to change. They are already changing, and, and there was going to be again uh, a, a moment where you know the status quo could no longer be sustained. Uh, so in that sense, he, he does have a point, and more should have certainly been done ahead of time. We, we on the way here, for example, I, I spoke to uh, an Australian guard slash interpreter. Uh, the Australian the Afghan guard and like staffer of the Australian embassy uh, who worked who worked there, and he was there with his family, and we started talking, and he was telling me how before the crisis, uh, only four members of the entirety of the Australian staff, um, the Afghan staff at the Australian embassy, were actually uh, like given visas to to move with their family to migrate to Australia. And then we all know what happened. And then overnight, Australia changed its position and, and, and gave out more visas. Uh, I'm saying that, because, and this is the same with the whole, with the SIV program, which is the American program, special immigrant visa program uh, for similar people, uh, uh, which until very recently, you know, uh, there were some numbers uh, on the news. Uh, out of the 20,000 applications before the crisis, only 700 were at the final stages. Um, and, and hence they were close to being relocated. It's a, because ahead of the crisis, there was a great degree of anxiety about the Afghans coming into our societies as a whole, an apprehension towards giving these people refuge. And uh, then all of that changed with the, with, with the takeover, sudden seemingly takeover by the Taliban. But it shouldn't have been sudden, and I don't think it was sudden. We, it's, we, there's, a, there's almost this, romantic notion of the so-called blitzkrieg and the 10-day takeover of the whole country, which clearly Taliban would like to reproduce. And we seem to also reproduce it because it fits some sort of a narrative about all of us being caught off guard. But the reality is, I think since May, we have had enough indicators that they were uh, on the rise and they were really, really bent on a total takeover of the country. And that's exactly how it materialized. Thank you, Majib. Uh, William, do you, do you agree with this assessment that uh, there's been this narrative, uh, as Majib has described it, a romanticised, uh, if you will, exoticised narrative about uh, Afghanistan falling so quickly to, to the Taliban? Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, does, does Majib have a point here? And, 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 and I'm interested too in your thoughts on whether uh, something like this and by this, I mean the collapse of um, the Afghan, pre-Taliban Afghan government, the return of the Taliban, displaced person, was, was something like this always inevitable, uh, given that uh, uh, occupation has uh, not generated many good results in Afghanistan over the years? No, I don't think it was inevitable. Um, the uh, international uh, activity in Afghanistan, I don't think, was doomed. Uh, it was undermined massively by things like the invasion of Iraq by the United States in 2003, which had ramifications for other areas in the world that were really quite dramatic and which the more insightful American observers now recognize. Uh, I think it was absolutely clear that the uh, agreement that the United States signed with the Taliban on the 29th of February 2020 in Doha was an exit agreement for the United States. It was not a peace agreement for Afghanistan. And essentially, the Americans at that point gave the Taliban everything that they really wanted, which created no incentive for the Taliban to negotiate in good faith with the Afghan government thereafter. I also fully expected that things would unravel very quickly in Afghanistan. I checked my diary the other day and I had a lunch with some officials in, in May, early May, where I predicted things would happen far more quickly in Afghanistan than most people had anticipated. And the reason for that was partly historical, that uh, if you look at earlier regime collapses in Afghanistan, as in 1992 or 2000 and one, they tend to occur within about a month of the onset of a crisis uh, rather than be drawn out. And there's a reason for that, which is that it doesn't pay to be on the losing side. And people's normative commitments, which may not be to the Taliban at all, 
run the risk of being over, overridden by the prudential desire not to be on the losing side, because it often doesn't pay to be on the losing side in a place like Afghanistan. And that can lead to a situation in which people switch sides uh, because they see that as the most rational thing to do in the circumstances that confront them. It's, it's really a reflection of Hobbes's comment that reputation of power is power. And the Americans undermined the reputation of power for the Afghan government, and they boosted the reputation of the Taliban. There was one other problem, uh, which was that the specifics of the agreement that the Americans um, signed with the Taliban really amounted to deflating the tires on the Afghan military machine. Uh, that the Americans committed to the withdrawal of contractors who were playing an absolutely critical role in sustaining the niche capabilities of the Afghan uh, military, even to the point where they extracted uh, the software uh, from helicopters that were used to uh, uh, enable them to uh, identify and, and target enemy on the ground. Uh, and uh, this uh, reflected the fact that the bulk of international forces were actually withdrawn from Afghanistan by the end of 2014. The whole process since then was concerned with inducing the United States to extract the critical niche capabilities that were actually sustaining both the Afghan uh, National Army and also confidence within the population that they were not about to be abandoned. And in that, that's the sense in which the diplomatic process, which we've just witnessed, is probably the most clumsy, blundering, incompetent example of diplomacy since Neville Chamberlain went to Munich to negotiate with Hitler in 1938. Shukufo, William has mentioned negotiations with the Taliban. Mary touched on uh, future, uh, a future need or, or, or question on, on, on negotiating with, with the Taliban. Um, can I get your thoughts on the sort of diplomatic relations that you believe uh, should be uh, considered with respect to the Australian bilateral relationship with Afghanistan now, given that the Taliban is in power? I think it should be handled very delicately uh, because I think there are so much at stake. Um, you know, uh, they've already sought a lot of political legitimacy to begin with. Um, as Professor Wellen Mele said, it was an exit strategy, not a peace process. It was really apparent in the beginning because um, uh, when when the Afghan people were sidelined, when that process began, um, I think that the fear and anxiety of people in general arose uh, to the aftermath of it. And here we are, obviously, the people uh, of Afghanistan feel very, very alone and unsupported. Um, um, I think that um, uh, with uh, you know uh, the whole of population, they feel like they are in a in a hostage situation, um, and so I think with with the with the ongoing um, so relationship of Australia, um, it is checked account in, in the uh, account the gains that have been made in the last twenty years. Um, obviously, um, Minister Payne has said that we will continue um, to have relationship with Afghanistan into the future for peace building and the gains that we have made for. The rights of women and children. Uh, and the, the reality is that we can we should not be swayed by the words of the Taliban. We need to be really careful about um, you know, how they um, implement those policies. It, it's one thing for them to make promises, it, though in very vague terms and uh, sort of uh, you know, very broad Sharia law um, uh, frame, as they say it. Uh, but I think that uh, time will tell in, in, in terms of how they will implement it. Unfortunately, we are hearing already from uh, rural um, areas, especially, uh, or um, you know, cities other than Kabul, where you don't actually have many cameras rolling and you don't have the sort of monitoring of the world there, that we're already hearing that women um, who have worked, say, with the, with the national police have been killed brutally while she was pregnant. And that goes to show the notoriety of Taliban and the fact that they have uh, fundamentally not changed. Um, and so we are really, it, it's really surreal to really think that um, uh, we are now at the, at the mercy of the Taliban as a government, um, never in the history of terror um, as a phenomenon in the movement, um, their movement, have they received such reception that they have been receiving in the last two, um, uh, two, two years, at least uh, from the US and the uh, broader um, international community, a recognition and a political legitimacy that led to this. Um, and I think that we need to be really careful with giving and granting that legitimacy. There are rights that need to be assured, there are guarantees that need to be placed um, when it comes to the rights of women, children, minorities, and people who have historically been persecuted by the Taliban. And we can only look at the very um, 
um, recent chapter of Afghanistan in the last 20 years, where you had a, an equilibrium between peace and war. Um, uh, the threats were all, uh, you know, uh, that were facing the Afghan population were from the Taliban. Um, Taliban were taking active responsibility for explosions, suicide bombing, massacre of children and women. Um, and so I think that in, in considering all of that, uh, we need to be really careful about how we handle that. But in the meantime, we really need to pay attention to the needs of the Afghan population and really then mold our response um, to that relationship that we need to have with the Taliban as a government. Thank you. And we'll, we'll come to questions very shortly. Thank you for all, the, all of the activity on Slido. We, we have, we've got a really healthy list of questions coming through. But before we go to that, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts, Mary, uh, on, on how we should be thinking about uh, re relating to the Taliban and, and, and work and uh, I guess what kind of a relationship needs to be established with um, an Afghan government that is mm. run by the Taliban? What are your thoughts on on this, Mary? How do we get it right, given the obvious human rights issues and concerns here? Well, I think that's a really good question, Tim. Um, I don't know that I have the answer other than to say I don't see the Taliban as a monolithic concept. I think, as we've already seen, um, in Kabul... And in the regions, you get two very different uh, experiences. And in fact, uh, that is why so many people from the regions have fled to the big city to seek protection there. Um, the way the Taliban behaves in the big cities is going to be different to out in the, in the uh, remote areas where I think you've always had a series of warlords um, governing particular areas. So... Look, uh, there's a reason that foreign powers have found Afghanistan so difficult over so many years. Uh, it really is a very, very interesting country, and um, Professor Bill can, can attest to this. Uh, what do we do? How do we behave? Well, we have to find a way to treat with whoever manages to form a government in Afghanistan for multiple reasons. Um, the other issue that we haven't addressed here is the role that China is playing and indeed other area, other countries in the region, including Pakistan, um, in, in terms of coming into the void that's going to be left with the withdrawal of the US. Uh, Afghanistan is a very resource rich country and that's why countries over, uh, over centuries have been trying to take take uh, the state over. So uh, look, I can't answer that question, Tim, but uh, it, it clearly is much more in the realm of, of the expertise of, of Professor Maley, uh, other than to say that it's going to be difficult, but we have to do it. We did mm -hmm. it with Vietnam and we have to do it here as, again. Yep. No, thank you, Mary. Uh, let's go to questions uh, now. And if we, the challenge I'm going to give our panelists here in the interest of trying to get through as many questions as we can is um, I'm going to, to ask them to, to, to give a very quick response to these questions so that we can move through as many as we can. Uh, so let's take the first one. Considering the ongoing pandemic, environmental and other humanitarian crises, how can we avoid fatigue on this issue? Uh, William, what do you think? How do we avoid fatigue on this given everything else going on? Uh, I think fatigue should be taken for granted. Uh, there is just too much crowding on the international agenda at the moment for it to be realistic to expect that uh, Afghanistan is going to remain at the top, particularly because the Taliban at a certain point are going to be very keen to cut down uh, vision coming out of Afghanistan that points to any deficit in their control of the situation there. Uh, what I think it's important to do, therefore, is to develop a principled way of responding to the situation in Afghanistan in terms of a principled approach to protection of refugees, a principled approach to the development of humanitarian assistance, and a, in particular, a principled approach to engagement. There we have the advantage that uh, Australia recognises states only so that we can uh, engage pragmatically with the Taliban without that constituting diplomatic recognition of any kind. And my sense is that there's no appetite in Western circles for any kind of formal 
recognition of the Taliban, partly because they're brutal, partly because they are really a terrorist group, uh, and uh, partly because there's little confidence that anything they say is truthful in any meaningful sense of the term. So I think we'll see pragmatic engagement, but it is very important to affirm a set of clear principles that will guide the way in which powers in the outside world approach the situation in Afghanistan. Thank you, William. Uh, Shakufa, let me ask you the next question, which is from Shabnam. Uh, there is no doubt that Australians agree and support more action for Afghanistan is needed right now. How do we make our politicians listen to these calls and take action, particularly if it goes against some of their own legacy policies? Um, I think that um, sort of that legacy was in place when Tony Abbott was um, a prime minister as well. I mean, we were really like afresh. We had um, Australia had just passed like the legacy caseload legislations in the parliament. And um, in fact, Abbott's um, prime ministership was actually won on the, on the back of anti boat sentiments, anti refugee sentiments that he had. Yet the public sentiment was enough to convince him to take an action and actually announce an intake of um, Syrian and Iraqi refugees from Middle East. So if that if then that's possible. Now it's absolutely possible because we see all parts of Australian community coming together to help this, uh, you know, support the call for more intake. For actually, also importantly, I think uh, decision making that's closest uh, to the decision makers domestically. For instance, we can make a decision without any cost for those pe the, uh, refugees who have sought asylum on the basis that you know they have uh, run away from the Taliban um, uh, who are living in Australia in limbo for over nine years at least. You know, we can um, change that instrument of migration um, uh, act to enable family reunion for temporary visa holders and give them permanent protection, which is the only form of meaningful protection, we can actually then change instruments that, that relates to deprioritization of, you know, um, Afghan refugees, uh, thousands of them who are wait, still waiting for their citizenship to kind of, uh, you know, um, sort of fulfill the prerequisite to reunite with their families who are stuck inside Afghanistan. We don't have to go far, too far or too remote to sort of fulfill some obligations that are closest to Australian decision making and 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 comes without a cost and it's very um, easy given that the public support is there in a very unprecedented level and while that exists I think the politicians can do that without any without any risk of uh, sort of losing support for instance. Thank you I hope that answers your question Shabnam. Uh, Mujib I might ask you to respond to the next two questions on our list. Uh, first up is it okay for you to explain the entire situation very quickly of course uh, happening in Afghanistan um, and also the second question there, what does the future look like? How would the Taliban pay for the administration of Afghanistan, given that much of the Afghan central bank's reserves is phys physically outside the country and 70 to 80 percent of the government's income you know, comes from foreign aid? Mujib? Yeah, no, look, uh, I, I can't go into too much detail in, in terms of the first question. There are a couple of books right there uh, lying at behind that question, but I would just say this much. To me, the conflict in Afghanistan uh, is a, in many ways about uh, diverging attempts at grafting Islamic perspectives onto models of uh, a, a modern state model, right? So this has been like over the last 45 years, this is, it's been the conflict has been about interpretations of what does it mean to have an Islamic state or an Islamic Republic or Islamic government. Um, if, if we were to narrow down our focus to the, to the last 20 years, we had, uh, we've had this contestation over, uh, over, over between two groups, one Western backed, Western supported liberal uh, that took its cues from sort of a Western, a more nakedly or starkly Western a set of cultural priorities, and that was the former government of Mohammed Karzai and then Ashraf Ghani later on. Um, and because of the resistance against that interpretation, we had essentially the war on terror and the violence that emanated from that. On the other hand, we have the Taliban. Now, the Taliban, we shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse this. They are not an, 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 an explicit uh, Islamist uh, movement. They don't quite subscribe to that. They, if we remember in the 90s, they rose explicitly as a backlash against the fundamentalism of Islamists at the time who were more inspired by, you know, the Egyptian or the Pakistani variants of political Islam. So, so they, are, they are somewhere in between. It's, very, it's not very easy to categorize them, but to me, they're somewhere in between a tradition 
that looks to the, let's say, the Afghan village and its Sufi Islam and its sort of a, a more spiritualist approach to organization of society and almost egalitarian approach to organization of society. But it's in between that and sort of a more neo Deobandi, neo uh, sort of Islamist approaches. That still, I think, especially with, uh, since the February of 2020, when the Doha agreement was struck, we know for sure that they have uh, no desire for any sort of globalist or even regional uh, political expansion. That's simply not in their ideology that's simply not in their political discourse. Uh, so, so just to sort of summarize it, to me, the conflict is between interpretations of what, it, what does it mean for Afghan society to organize power? And the clashes, unfortunately, uh, because they're based, on, they're based on ideologies and these ideologies time and again for six, uh, and during sort of for six different periods of so-called what Afghans call or a change in the political class, for six times, we've had a radical slash fundamentalist ideological groups trying to impose their interpretation of what the state and its relationship to society should be. Um, and on to the second question as to what the future could look like. Look, I think Taliban to me is a reality. They're going to be there. I think they're talking about fatigue and perhaps stamina. I don't quite see it in the Western world to try to do anything as dramatic as you know, October of 2001, when they went into Afghanistan. On the other hand, we see, and, and Professor Mary uh, alluded to this, we have China, which is already being branded quite publicly by the Taliban as their principal diplomatic partner. Uh, there's a very close uh, relationship with Pakistan. Um, I think uh, there would be, and, and then of course, uh, it is the fact that Taliban has changed. It's not the 90s anymore, and they are quite uh, aware of that and they articulated in different ways. They have so-called uh, matured. Um, I think what that leaves us with is this particular reality there that we have. We have over 35 million Afghans who don't have a recourse to, or, or an alternative to move to a Western country, seek refuge there. Um, and for the sake of all of that, and given these changed, I suppose, circumstances under consideration, I think uh, in the future, uh, Taliban would enter into uh, different sorts of understandings or uh, 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 they would be recognized essentially uh, by more and more countries. It's, it would start by those countries that I mentioned earlier, but it would kind of grow from there. Turkey is another country that I think would recognize it quite soon. Qatar would be another one. But then that leaves us with, uh, again, going back to the question of obligation. I think countries like Australia have an obligation, not only the people, who were displaced involuntarily, um, which is, uh, clearly has, you know, it, it says it has as much to do with the people who are displaced as it does about us. But it's also about humanitarian responsibilities to people, moral and legal, to people who are stuck back home. And in that sense, I think uh, we 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 should we should we should do more, and 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 we have to do it for the sake of um, Afghans. Okay, thank you, Mujib. Lots there. Um... Let's try and uh, get a few more questions to our panel before we uh, wrap up. Um, the, the, uh, I'll bypass the top question there and come to it very shortly, but I wanted to clump the second and third question for you, Mary. What type of aid do you think will, will assist Afghans the most? Most, and, and if we just jump and segue to the third question there on the list, most of the conversation has been about those who supported our troops, but we also need to help those who worked for the Australian foreign aid community, construction of schools, women's empowerment. What is Australia going to do for them? Uh, your thoughts on that, Mary? And I am I'm going to uh, go out on a limb here and say that uh, we can do more to help people in Afghanistan if we do start to engage with the people who form government. Um, I know that it's very difficult to do that, but there are levers that uh, are there to be pulled in terms of foreign aid and in terms of the money that's being held internationally. Uh, but having said that, I think Australia is a very small player in this and much will really turn on the attitude of the US um, going forward. But um, I, my personal view is that we should always start with the local, start with the community, with the connections that we already have with individuals in Afghanistan and without putting individuals at risk because that's 
a real um, issue at the moment. If you communicate with people, it could very well put them at risk. But we've got connections there. And I think either we try and push our government to set up uh, and to barter, to bargain for or argue for an orderly departure program, um, or we find ways to actually keep supporting people in, in situ. 35 people in Afghanistan, clearly 35 people do not want to leave Afghanistan. Um, I think when you have upheavals like this, very often it's very easy for Australians on their little island, big island, to suddenly think, oh, they'll all want to come to Australia. They won't, they don't. Um, but where we have connections, those connections are real. Those connections carry moral obligations. And I think we individually should do our best to honour them. But um, to answer a question further down the page here, should we impose sanctions on the Pakistani government for their support of the Taliban? That would be um, emotionally very satisfying. But politically, I think, uh, I'll ask you this too, uh, Professor Bill, uh, somewhat unwise. Pakistan is continuing to carry the burden of most of the refugees from Afghanistan. And um, I think uh, the more, more connections you can keep open, the better in, in all of this. Thank you, Mary. And in the interest of time, I might ask the panel to wrap up now. So my apologies, we haven't got, got through all of the questions you've put up uh, on Slido, but I want to give an opportunity to our panellists to give some closing reflections before we wrap up this afternoon. It's been a very rich discussion. Uh, but to each of the panellists, uh, if I can get a very quick 30 second uh, answer on, on the following question, uh, what's the most important thing we can do to uh, fulfil our responsibilities as uh, Australians to the people of Afghanistan? And William, I might open it up with you. Yes. Uh, look, I think we have to be starkly realistic at the moment. And one of the elements of reality that we need to recognise is that uh, what's happened in Afghanistan has not just been a product of an internal conflict, although, as uh, Mujib made clear, there's, there are very different visions that have been on offer. It's also been a creeping invasion from Pakistan uh, with uh, sanctuaries uh, for the Taliban uh, and logistical support and finance being absolutely critical to their surge through Afghanistan. This was not a campaign uh, of uh, roving gangs. It was a campaign with a very, very clear strategic vision underpinning it, almost certainly coming out of general headquarters in Rawalpindi. Uh, and if we're not... Uh, willing to recognise that this is a transnational conflict rather than just an internal conflict, then we're going to undertake the kind of misdiagnosis that really poisoned the diplomatic endeavours of the United States. Thank you, William. Um, and a quick closing reflection from you, Shakufa. Um, I think that um, Australia, looking at actually Australian government and what Australia can do internally, domestically, as well as um, outside in Afghanistan, I think that um, the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, a terrorist group, um, will have a knock-on effect um, uh, to the entire region and perhaps to the world. And so keeping really close eye and getting uh, really staying engaged with, with issues that emerges out of Afghanistan, but also, um, unfortunately, as time goes by and the media cycle um, gets tired or fatigued, um, a silent humanitarian catastrophe would continue to take place under the administration of the Taliban government. And so therefore it's really important to have a watch, you know, stay engaged in, in, in Afghanistan issues. And what we can do from here in terms of um, you know, helping is really staying in touch with the Afghan diaspora communities. They are really you know, involved in this, either it is um, actually in financial terms, uh, mm -hmm. helping humanitarian measures, but also uh, pushing for calls in, 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 in foreign policy changes, um, really taking the lead from them. Uh, importantly, I think that um, we need to look to the uh, sort of um, uh, refugees that live in Australia, 5,100 who are in, in a you know, literal limbo, given the crisis, uh, we need to really see whether we can actually change policies because um, the public sentiments are in our favor to do that. It is possible, it's a win-win situation, and it really depends on the stroke of a pain. Okay, thank you, Shakufa. We've got a minute left. So, Mujib, 30 seconds from you and then to Mary. Just, just uh, reiterating what Shakufa just said. And secondly, I think this is an opportunity for all of us collectively in, in, in Australia, I would imagine, uh, I'd venture to say the whole of the Western world, to take the Afghan catastrophe, the terrible two decades that we have just experienced, uh, and, and learn from it and sit with it and reflect on it uh, so that we don't end up committing ourselves to um, 
subjecting another country for another two, two decades, three decades, four decades to essentially colonialism and imperialism. We have got to learn from this moment. That, that, that's what I would request for all the listeners here. to ponder. Thank you, Mujib. And Mary, a final yeah. word from you. Well, I think I agree with, with everybody. Um, I would like us to stay engaged is the final word for me, um, because I think after the Vietnam War, the disengagement from the region had some catastrophic uh, results. I would also like us to think local uh, and start with the Afghans that we have in Australia and um, recognise and, and acknowledge the moral obligation and the legal obligations that we have for these people because of our engagement in this conflict over so many years. Thank you, Tim. Mary, and the perfect note on which to end today's discussion, uh, the obligations we owe can't just be legal, they're also moral and so important that we do what we can to support uh, action at the local level, particularly uh, Afghan diaspora communities here in Australia. Um, thank you so much, Mary, William, Shakufa, Mujib. It's been a great discussion. Thank you for your engagement to audience members. It's been great to get your questions and look forward to seeing you again at Sydney Ideas very soon.